Hi everyone, welcome to the Swift Arcade. I'm your host, Jonathan Rasmussen. In this video, we're gonna take a look at closures, specifically closures as a communication pattern. Closures can be a bit daunting at first, and we're gonna tackle closures by first looking at what closures are, how basic closures work, and then we'll look at some specific things you need to understand if you're gonna use closures when building applications. All right, let's begin. Closures are self-contained blocks of code that you can pass around and use in other parts of your application. They are really powerful and neat because when you define a closure, you have reference to all the variables and constants defined just outside its scope. There are three parts to a closure. A closure's inputs, its output, and then the block of code or statements that the closure wraps and represents. A good example of how a typical closure works in Swift is the arrays sorted by method. Sorted by has a closure as part of its definition, which is right here. It takes two elements, which for us are both going to be strings, and then returns a Boolean indicating which one of those strings is larger compared to the other. So in order to use this closure in sorted by, we first need to define a function which matches the sorted by closure definition, which for us is right here. We can define a function called backward, which takes two strings and returns a Boolean, and then inside explain what happens when this closure is run. In this case, we want to return a Boolean indicating whether the first string is larger than the second. We can pass that function or closure into the sorted by method and voila, it will return our sorted names for us. Of course, that's just the beginning of what closures can do. They can also be inlined. For example, here we could take our closure and call it directly. We could take the code which executes in our backward here and inline it directly in the sorted method by itself. Now this is the long-winded way of calling sorted by by explicitly typing out the full definition and then passing in our code here. But look at all the syntactic sugar and optimizations the compiler makes to make working with closures even easier. We can infer a lot of the type from the context of the closure itself. So we can drop the strings, we can drop the Boolean, and we can inline things all in one line like this. But we can then go further. The return type can be inferred, so we can remove that. And we can even use this shorthand, which closure is used for elements coming in. We can replace the S1 and the S2 with dollar sign zero, dollar sign one. But it keeps getting even better from that. There's something called a trailing closure, which basically means if the closure is the last element in your method, you can just define it like this without even having to have it defined as a method parameter here. And then because in this particular case, the closure is so smart and it realizes those two operands, you can even drop the dollar sign zero on the dollar sign one and just give it that greater than sign. Now, don't worry if a lot of that seems like magic. I don't wanna spend a lot of time getting into all the abbreviations of how closures can be used. What I really wanna get into with you is show you how closures can be used as communication patterns when building applications. So let's jump in and take a look and see how we can build a weather service using closures now. Okay, so the weather service we're gonna be building looks just like this. It's very simple, there's a fetch weather button. We're going to hit that button and our weather service is gonna go out, fetch the weather, and then come back and update our UI. And we're gonna do all of this with a closure. Let's walk through the code quickly and then do a deep dive after. Now on the surface, the code looks beautiful and deceptively easy. Let's just walk through what's happening here. When we hit our blue button, fetch weather, weather gets pressed here. This is the method that gets called, and this is where we call our fetch weather service. We are gonna pass in a closure. This is the code we want to execute when the weather service returns, and that, of course, is gonna update our view and uh, update our UI. The closure service is where the closure definition is defined on fetch weather. So here is what it looks like. Here are the inputs to the closure. It's called closure weather. Here's the output. The output of the closure is void. The closure has a variable name. We're calling it completion here. And once we fetch our weather, we are going to execute the closure passing back the weather we just received. This is gonna get passed back to where we called it from up here, and we're gonna use that to update the weather. It's beautiful, it's simple, very few lines of code, but there's some subtleties going on in there that you may not appreciate uh, when you first look at this from the surface. So let's dive a little bit deeper now and take a deeper look at what's going on. 
So the first thing to understand here is what's the problem that the closure is really attempting to solve for us? And where you see closures really come in handy is whenever you have asynchronous programming going on in your applications. For example, our weather service here. In the code that we looked at, I just created the weather and returned it instantly. But in a real application, this could be a long running process where we need to go out, do an HTTP request, fetch the weather, and that could all happen asynchronously, probably on a background thread. Closures are really good at letting us inject code in and execute it after a long running process like this is returned. Where I find closures can get confusing for new people, however, is the direction of communication in which they flow. For example, if you look at all the closure examples in the Swift documentation, they're all one way. We're always passing closures into a method and then having that method use the closure for some kind of computation, like in our array.sorted method. Here we define a function, we pass it in, and that's used in the function we pass it into to do some kind of computation. But that's not what we want when building applications. Typically, when we use closures building apps, we're not doing the computation in the function we're passing it to. We often want the result of what that method does, and we want it to be passed back to us. This is a slightly different communication flow, and it's one that can be confusing when you first get into it, because all the examples you see are one way, but what we really want is a closure that returns information the other way. To see what I mean, let's take a look at how we define a closure on our weather service. Okay, so here's our closure weather service, and here's our fetch weather function, which takes a city and then the completion block. Let's just break this down and see what's going on here. When we define this closure here, we have to follow this pattern. First, we have to define the input parameters. Here we're saying it's our closure weather object. Then we have to define the return type, here void. And then we need the statements or what's going to be executed when that closure is called. And for us, that is our view update method from where we're calling it. These are the statements that we're passing into the closure here from a direction. And this is what's going to get executed when this closure executes. Now let's look what happens when we're actually in the fetch weather method. This is where we could go out, do our asynchronous call and fetch the weather. But look how we communicate back. We're not using the statements here to do some computation in here like we did in the array sorted by method. Here we're taking that closure, which has the variable name completion, and we're executing it, passing in the weather. This is how we pass weather back to our update view here. It's the completion block, which is returning the value, which we can then use to update the view. This kind of blew my mind the first time I really saw what was going on here because it's a very different communication flow that we're used to. I'm used to defining a function, returning a value, and that's the end of it. But here, we're passing variables back via completion. It's a different mechanic, one that takes a bit of getting used to, but it can be a bit confusing at first, because watch this. You see this void here? If we actually made that a bool, that is what would be returned when we call this completion block. If we made the return type bool here, we would need to actually return a Boolean here from this block of code whenever we called it here, and that would be set here. So in that case, the information flow is even back this way. Again, don't worry, this can be really confusing at first, and I'll leave an example uh, in the code showing how this works. But I just want you to see how these closures are defined, how the flow of information works, and how executing a closure we can actually send information back from where it came. Now there is one pitfall or gotcha you do need to be aware of when working with closures, and that is what happens when you're doing things on a background thread. One example we kind of glossed over when doing this example is what would happen if we were to do this request on a background thread. For example, instead of simply getting the weather like this and returning it immediately, what if we did that on a background thread, which would be more typical of what would actually happen? So here the request is going out to the web, it's returning it, and now we hit this completion block. Let's take a look at what happens. What that actually means is that our, our closure is now no longer non-escaping. Non-escaping means our closure is executed immediately within the scope of the function it calls. So when we didn't have this uh, background thread going on here and we executed this immediately, because this completion block is executed immediately within the scope of this function, there's no problem here. It can go ahead and do that. There's nothing to worry about. But as soon as we put that on a background thread, 
that changes the context of when this completion block is executed. Now, instead of being executed immediately, it happens on a background thread two seconds later somewhere else. Swift likes us to make this explicit. And we can do that by putting the word escaping in front of our closure like this. In Swift, we call this an escaping closure, and it simply means a closure that runs after a method returns. What that means is we're acknowledging that this is gonna execute beyond the scope of which it runs here, which then also has a knock-on effect from when we call it. And if we come up here, it's now saying, hey, this is gonna also be executed, not immediately, but on a background thread, which means you need to be explicit in how you reference it, which we can then do by putting the word self here. So that's just one of the gotchas to be careful of. When you start doing things on background threads, you're gonna see this escaping, and all it means is the completion block here runs beyond the scope of the method, and that's something we just need to make explicit in our code. So what are some of the pros of using closures? Well, closures are beautiful and elegant. They take very few lines of code, they're extremely terse, and Swift makes it really easy to use these when building applications. So it's really something we want to get familiar with and good at. The cons, there aren't many, but I'll admit it can be confusing at first. Reading the closure syntax is a bit strange, and there is lots of magic that goes on behind the scenes, and that can make it hard to read at first. But once you get used to it, once you get more comfortable with the flow of communication, both to and out of a closure, using them when building applications is really great and will make your code a lot easier to read, use, and understand. Which is why I like to give closures a big thumbs up. Okay, well that does it for this episode of Swift Arcade. I hope you found that useful. Source code for everything you see here is available in the repo. And if you like what you see, hit like, do subscribe, and uh, we'll see you next time. Okay, take care everybody. Bye-bye.